Hi, my name is Jason Kronk. I am a privacy engineer with Interprivacy Consulting Group. I'm also the author of Strategic Privacy by Design. This work grew out of an engagement uh, I had with an early adopter of the NIST privacy framework, uh, and I thought it might be beneficial for others to hear uh, how I proceeded in working uh, on that, uh, that assignment. So I want to give you a little bit of background information. So NIST, the National Institutes of Standard, uh, introduced their cybersecurity framework back in 2014. Uh, it quickly became a standard used by both industry and government agencies. Uh, in 2018, they updated the framework. Uh, and earlier this year, they introduced their privacy framework, which they hoped would do uh, for privacy what the cybersecurity uh, framework did for uh, cybersecurity offices. So the frameworks are are divided into three components, cores, profiles, and tiers. Uh, most people associate the frameworks with the core. Uh, I'm also going to be talking about profiles today. So the core uh, is divided into functions, categories, and subcategories. Uh, so here we have the identify function, uh, and under it are the categories of asset management and business environment. Uh, and then there are subcategories within each category. For instance, this one is uh, uh, priorities for organization, organizational mission, objective, and activities are established and communicated. Both the cybersecurity framework and privacy framework are divided into five core functions. Uh, two of those functions are similar uh, between the two frameworks. Uh, they both have identify and protect. Uh, the other three are distinct. Uh, within those functions uh, and categories and subcategories, some of the subcategories are the same. Uh, so for instance, within Identify, uh, both uh, frameworks have uh, priorities for organizational mission objectives and activities are established and communicated uh, as a subcategory. Uh, some of the subcategories have been slightly modified. Uh, so in the cybersecurity framework, you have uh, physical access to assets is managed and protected. Uh, but the similar one in the privacy framework under protect is physical access to data and devices is managed. Uh, so they've kind of changed it to, uh, to bring in the aspects, uh, uh, the privacy aspects, and in this case, uh, the concern over data, uh, not just physical assets. Uh, and then, of course, you have the distinct uh, categories uh, and subcategories. Uh, for instance, uh, within the privacy framework uh, has govern, uh, and this one is uh, privacy values, policies, and training are reviewed and uh, any updates are communicated. Notice I highlighted privacy values here. Uh, I will get back to that soon. Now, the question you may naturally be asking is, we have these subcategories, but how do we actually use them? Uh, most organizations, unfortunately, tend to just kind of use them as a checklist uh, going through. Uh, the way the NIST privacy framework suggests you use them is to develop profiles. Uh, now you have your current profile, which is, you know, the, the activities that you are doing that match the, the subcategory within the category and the function. Uh, and the target profile is where you would like to be. Uh, but that still leaves a lot of questions of, of what do you put in that target profile? How do you decide what the elements are? And uh, I tend to analogize this to a muffin pan, right? The framework is the, the pan, uh, so it's going to build muffins that are circular and so deep. Uh, but what kind of ingredients do you put uh, into those muffins? Are you making cornbread muffins? Are you making cupcakes? Are you making... Uh, you know, what types of muffins are you doing? Are you adding jalapenos to the cornbread, et cetera? So um, this, is, this is the essence of the profile. So for instance, you might have a, uh, you know, uh, this PRACP2, uh, and it has certain ingredients like security guards at building entrances. Exterior doors are locked and alarmed. USB ports are disabled. Uh, all servers are in locked cages. Well, that might be perfectly appropriate for an organization that has a data center, uh, but if you don't have a data center, those ingredients aren't gonna make sense for you. So again, how do you go about figuring out what are the appropriate ingredients uh, that you put in? 
So we know we need to fill profile with ingredients, uh, but why pick uh, particular ingredients over others? Uh, NIST provides uh, an answer in that they suggest that profiles enable the prioritization of outcomes and activities that best meet organizational privacy values, mission or business needs, and risks. So those are four concepts that need to go into identifying you know, what our, private, our profile is, what our privacy values are, what our business needs are, uh, and what the risks are. Uh, now, privacy values, you notice I highlighted again, turns up 14 times in the NIST privacy framework, uh, yet nowhere do they define it or really uh, provide any guidance on how organizations should identify their privacy values. So privacy does have this definition problem, right? So most people can point out, you know, when they see something that they think is a privacy violation, uh, either of their privacy or somebody else's, but they have a hard time defining that. Uh, and so, so there's two legal terms that I want to introduce here, malum in se and malum prohibitum. Uh, malum in se means evil, wrongdoing in itself, uh, like murder. Uh, malum prohibitum is wrong just because the law or a statute says so. Uh, like speeding. Uh, there isn't anything inherently wrong with speeding. Uh, that's just uh, going over a certain speed limit. That's just where the law uh, sets that speed for that particular road. Uh, privacy tends to be the, the former. Uh, it's things that we uh, innately or as a society agree uh, that are wrong. It's not wrong because it's the law. Uh, so we can think of privacy as a set of social norms. Uh, okay, so that really helps. So let's look further into this. So there are numerous models of social norms uh, that abound. So uh, Alan Weston has his states of privacy, uh, anonymity, intimacy, seclusion, solitude. Woody Harzog uh, recently wrote in his book, uh, Privacy Blueprint, uh, his three privacy pillars of obscurity, autonomy, and trust. Uh, Prosser, uh, the famed torts professor, had his privacy torts of common law, uh, placing somebody in a false light, intrusion upon seclusion, uh, public disclosure of private facts, uh, and appropriation of name and likeness. Uh, and Ryan Kahlo has his objective and subjective harms. Uh, so th those on the left uh, that are kind of with the, the black background, those are more positive things. Those are things that we uh, as a society aspire to or, or privacy values or, or privacy norms that we aspire to. Uh, the ones on the right, the privacy torts and Kalo's uh, harms uh, are, are harms that we want to try to avoid. Now, I am myself partial to Professor Daniel Solov's taxonomy of privacy harms. Uh, in his taxonomy, he divides privacy into 16 types of harms uh, in four broad categories, information processing, information dissemination, collection, uh, and invasions. And I, I, I like Professor Solov's uh, grouping here because it's at once uh, comprehensive uh, and it covers uh, really the breadth of almost anything uh, that I certainly have been able to think of that, that one would consider a privacy violation. Uh, and also it's granular enough, they're small enough uh, that they're easy to work with. Uh, unlike some of the others like uh, Ryan Kahlo's objective and subjective harms, uh, which the categories are very broad uh, and they're hard to really uh, to, to really work with. Uh, now, this is not to say that these are the only five models of privacy norms. Uh, there are many others uh, out there. Uh, these are just the ones that are uh, probably most prominent. Uh, the other one that's worth mentioning that I, that I don't go into here is Helen Niesenbaum's uh, contextual integrity. Uh, the, the, the only issue I have with, with her contextual integrity is uh, unlike these, which define specific harms, she defines a process uh, for, uh, for, for identifying harms. Uh, so it's a little bit uh, more difficult to work with in, in that aspect because it doesn't actually tell you what the norm is. It just tells you how to discover those norms. 
So now we have a set of model privacy norms that we can use. How do we go about using that within NIST uh, and building that in and using those for our privacy values that NIST uh, references? So I didn't just pick one particular model uh, to use. Uh, what I did first was try to align the models and find where there were similarities and overlap. Uh, for instance, uh, I chose uh, Woody Harzog's trust uh, and Dan Solov's uh, breach of confidentiality, secondary use, and insecurity. So why did I choose to, to map uh, these to each other? So trust is about a willingness to become vulnerable to the actions of another. So you share information with somebody uh, under the guise of confidentiality, uh, you are putting yourselves in a vulnerable position uh, with the understanding that they're not going to again go and disseminate that uh, and breach that confidentiality. Similarly, with secondary use, uh, you give somebody information for one purpose uh, and that makes you vulnerable to them then taking it uh, and, and uh, using it for another purpose, uh, a secondary use. Uh, so you trust them not to do it. And similarly, insecurity uh, is like a fiduciary duty. Uh, you are trusting somebody with information that they are going to take appropriate care of it uh, and not be negligent in its handling. So now how do we take these models of privacy norms and turn them into organization specific values? Now, I've removed the column for Prosser because he didn't have any uh, overlap uh, with these particular norms uh, from Harzog, Weston, Kalo, and Solov. Uh, let's say we're working for a company called Textaclaric, and we have an app uh, that allows parishioners to send messages uh, to their religious leaders. So we might take these uh, particular privacy norms of trust, intimacy, uh, uh, avoiding uh, objective harm from Kalo, not wanting to breach confidentiality, secondary use, and not wanting to be insecure, and create a privacy value specifically for text to cleric, and we'll title it Seal of Confession. Uh, and in this privacy value, we say text to cleric will protect and not use or reveal any information divulged. So we've distilled these multiple privacy norms, uh, and in Solov's case, uh, combined different norms within his taxonomy to come up with one specific privacy value uh, for text cleric. And it sort of encompasses all of that uh, and is organization specific. So it's not this generic, uh, we respect uh, confidentiality or we won't use data for a secondary purpose, uh, but we've created a privacy value that is unique and specific for our organization. Now we're on to our next step. How do we take that specific privacy value uh, that is our organization's value and use that in the NIST privacy framework. Uh, so what I do is go through each of the subcategories and say, what can we do within this subcategory to achieve our privacy value or help us achieve our privacy value? Uh, so for instance, this first one in the identify function, uh, data actions, of the system product services are inventoried. So we may have a statement, uh, a uh, goal here, that all touch points for confessional message data are kept in a system architecture diagram. So this will help us protect that data uh, because we'll know where it is. It'll help us not use the data for a secondary purpose because we presumably understand what the systems are using it for. And there are other uh, subcategories that help us uh, understand those purposes. Uh, and it will help us not reveal any of the information because if, we, if our system architecture shows data going from the system with confessional data out to some other, uh, other destination, uh, we know we might have a concern about revealing that data. So this is going to help us achieve that privacy value. 
So the next one, uh, roles and responsibilities for the workforce are established with respect to privacy. So here we're going to have a CISO and a CPO with job responsibilities for security and privacy respectively. Now this may seem sort of obvious for, for a lot of companies or, or people watching, uh, but a lot of companies don't necessarily have those roles. Or maybe we need more specific roles uh, within the company, uh, you know, a privacy engineer, security engineer, uh, security, you know, a, a trained developer in, in security, whatever those roles are, but these are going to help us protect the data uh, and make sure that we're not using or revealing any information uh, inappropriately. It's going to be their job to be accountable uh, for, uh, for this privacy value. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them. I'll go through the last one. Uh, data and transit are protected. So, Again, we may have something more specific related to our specific privacy value that we're trying to achieve here. And that is, say, data between the parishioner's app and our systems are encrypted. Uh, and we could be more specific about, you know, uh, strong, uh, you know, strong encryption. Uh, maybe another one, and, and it doesn't have to be a one for one, right? There could be multiple uh, multiple items under each subcategory. So maybe another one might be data between the uh, between our systems and the religious leaders app uh, are encrypted. Now, just anecdotally, uh, I found most organizations have a very difficult time of understanding or incorporating privacy into their, their organization. Uh, they, you know, are they say, you know, we want to make sure we protect privacy, uh, but they don't define privacy in a way uh, that makes it actionable. Uh, so what I hope I've shown here today is uh, an actionable and systematic approach to taking a bunch of privacy norms uh, that we know that people ascribe to uh, either uh, harms or, uh, or, or positive uh, values uh, and deriving some organizational privacy values, some organization specific privacy values uh, that are really related to the organization and it, it, compass uh, those uh, those social norms. Uh, and that's the first step. And the second step is then to go through those norms with the framework's core and identify what elements, what ingredients, what actions and activities can we do uh, within the framework, within each of the categories and subcategories uh, that will help us achieve these sets of privacy values. Uh, now, I have three here. Uh, I found most organizations uh, tend to use about three to five uh, privacy values. Uh, as you start getting more than that, it gets a little overly complicated, uh, and too few uh, just doesn't seem like you're covering enough ground. Uh, so that's really it. It's really a two-step process. Uh, and, it, you know, hopefully I, you see that, you know, this is a systematic uh, process-oriented approach uh, to building privacy into your use of, uh, building privacy values into your use of the privacy framework. Here are some resources, including a link to the NIST privacy framework, a link to an infographic I did for these models of privacy norms that I've been using. Uh, also, I would encourage you to do a search for deriving and using synthetic consequences. Uh, Stuart Shapiro did a much more rigorous uh, and formal method of uh, deriving synthetic harms or consequences or privacy values uh, from, uh, from others. Uh, and that might be of interest to some. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions now.